I think one of the absolute best things about being a PA is our versatility, our ability to work in any specialty, and the ability to be able to go from the clinic to the OR without any additional certification. But there has always been kind of that hard line in the sand when it comes to surgery. PAs do not do solo surgery. That is the realm of the physicians, and rightly so. They spend many years in training to get to that point. But my guest today is one of only two PAs in the whole country that is allowed to and certified to do surgery on his own. (gasps) You may be wondering, how is this possible? And is it even right for this to be happening? Well, I'm going to ask my guest those questions. So if you're curious too, then stay tuned till the end to hear all that this fascinating guest has to say. Hi, it's Michelle with The Medicine Couch. Thanks for joining me today. If you like what I do and want to support the channel, then please hit the subscribe button down below and share my videos with your colleagues who may find them interesting. My name is Stephen DeVries. I'm a cardiothoracic surgery PA. been a PA for about 10 years now. graduated from the Des Moines University PA program in 2012. Well, great, Stephen. Thanks for joining us today, and I'm excited to hear about all that you've been doing. Tell us, first of all, kind of what your career path has been since PA school. I pretty much had tunnel vision that emergency medicine was going to be my career path. I took a job in the ER and did that for about three years. And although I didn't have any rotation in cardiothoracic surgery, I just did something drew me to it. And so about in my second to third year of emergency medicine, I kind of realized this wasn't where I wanted to be and started looking around for cardiothoracic surgery jobs. So finally uh, caught a break, uh, the kind of a smaller community hospital type program, had some great training there, learned how to do vein harvest, got more familiar with the cardiac OR. And then after a couple of years of that, I moved to more of the academic medical center type setting um, because I had a, a really strong interest in transplant and wanted to you know, get more into doing more academic medicine type of things, getting into research, doing more complex cases, being part of a more tertiary program. And it just so happened that the small community hospital that I was working at ended up merging with the local university program. And so I was kind of merged to their program as part of that. So it worked out well for me. I had some great experience with first assisting some complex cases, doing more vein harvest, and ultimately got really involved in the transplant program there. So tell us what you're doing now, though, that makes you so very special. I get really involved with thoracic organ procurement. And so now I'm doing heart and lung organ procurement independently as a PA. Um, there's, a, there's a credentialing process for that that's, that's driven by the organ procurement organizations or OPOs. And it's called ACIN certification. And so I was able to earn that credentialing for heart and lung as a PA and to go anywhere in the in the country and do that independently. If you don't mind, talk a little bit more about what organ procurement is and what that actually kind of involves. Our program would accept an organ for transplant, in, in my case, heart or lungs. We try and time everything out right where there's a procurement team that will go to the donor hospital, wherever that is in the United States. In the meantime, there's a second surgeon that stays with the recipient and kind of preps the recipient. So there's two teams working at the same time. And so there's a lot of coordination that goes into that. And so my role is to go out to wherever the donor is with our procurement team and then actually do the operation, enter the chest, assess either the heart or lungs, wherever we're taking for transplant, make sure that it's going to be viable report those findings back to the recipient surgeons so then they can decide whether or not they want to commit the recipient to the organ. And then once that's verified and we kind of get an idea for when we might be coming back with the organ, the recipient surgeon will start start the case on the recipient. And so my job is to is to do the operation to recover the organ, preserve it, and then take it home for transplant. Uh, I don't even know, can we call you a a surgeon? I don't know if surgeon, if that title is specific to physicians or not. Uh, Yeah, technically that's how how I'd be listed as a primary donor surgeon for whatever organ that we're accepting. And then usually there's another donor surgeon there taking the lungs and then usually one, if not two abdominal surgeons there taking the liver, kidneys, and pancreas. Okay, so you're there in the operating room. You are showing up at these, uh, you know, different hospitals and medical centers and, and you are the surgeon who is operating without an, an MD there supervising the, the surgery, correct? 
Correct. That is correct. Yep. Obviously, it's a little bit different situation in the fact that the patient is is brain dead. It's that they're an organ donor at this point. But still, I have to say that's pretty amazing to have a PA in that that role. And, and you said that there are uh, right now currently two PAs that are credentialed to do this in the U.S. that you know of, correct? Uh, that I'm a, that I'm aware of. Yeah. 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 Yes. Very very exciting. And and congratulations. So. To get prepared to do that, I mean, obviously you've had years of working in cardiothoracic surgery and doing vein harvesting on your own and assisting, first assisting in the surgeries. But when you went through this credentialing process, is there more additional training or is there some way that you have to show competency or how how does that work to get credentialed? So there's absolutely no formal pathway for this. And even, even with the credentialing process, there's really no specific guidelines. So for the most part, whenever the transplant program feels that one of their staff is qualified to do it, they will engage with the the local OPO that's working with that particular transplant program and submit the case logs that you've done. And, and then someone from the leadership of the transplant program will say, this person's ready to get signed off. Can we get them credentialed? The OPO will review it and then either accept or deny that and then they'll they'll approve the credentialing but there's no specific guidelines as far as you have to do this many donor hearts this many donor lungs no, nothing like that exists and so essentially I, I had to create my own pathway which was mostly just doing a lot of cases and then working with the the surgeons on my team and kind of proving my competence and then slowly gaining more independence with initially kind of helping them and then and then becoming the primary with them as the assistant. And then ultimately, you know, they were just kind of there in case something would go wrong until the point where they felt comfortable that I was ready to do this on my own. Because in dealing with donor cases, there's a lot more going on other than just being able to perform the technical steps of the operation. You know, you're working in an environment that a lot of times you've never been before. I mean, the ORs are all pretty much the same, but, you know, the instruments are always a little bit different, it seems. There's staff that you've never met before. You're in a city you've never been before, usually in the middle of the night. Um, and then on top of that, there's usually at least two other transplant programs that all have their own interests. And so you have to find a way to work with all of those people and in the same time, keeping the interests of your own program, making sure that the heart or the lungs is going to be viable, that nothing's going to jeopardize that. And if the donor becomes unstable, kind of got to work with everyone to figure out how to manage that. Is this something that we can salvage or do we got to urgently proceed with cross clamp in order to make sure the organs don't take too much of an ischemic hit? So kind of dealing with all of those dynamics is is kind of a whole nother level of training. I mean, it's something that I wasn't previously exposed to just working in the kind of elective cardiac OR. It was kind of a brand new environment. And so it took a long time to be able to comfortably deal with that because there's a lot of unknown variables. So you were working, doing regular cardiothoracic surgery, right? And then you transitioned more into transplant or was your program already, uh, you guys did a significant number of transplant cases already? When I started getting into transplant, our our transplant volumes were fairly low. And then me and a a couple of the heart transplant surgeons and then one of the lung transplant surgeons in particular really worked to grow the programs. And then we were able to mostly triple the volume on both sides and the heart and lung programs. And so we ended up getting very busy. So it was, it was exciting to be part of that growth. Um, But in the meantime, too, I was also doing a lot, you know, kind of the normal CT surgery PA stuff. So assisting elective cases, taking vein, helping in the unit, seeing patients in clinic, that kind of thing. So this was more of kind of an addition to my regular job. Okay. I mean, obviously your program is supportive of this because they had to be the ones to kind of put you forward, right? And to to sign off on you. But when you show up at other facilities, have you gotten any pushback or anybody questioning you or even saying that, look, our hospital policy doesn't allow for a PA to be the, the lead surgeon? I really know it's kind of surprisingly in a way. But I, I made a really big point early on to kind of understand all of the dynamics of, of organ donation, being in the donor OR. And so I became pretty confident dealing with kind of the dynamics of everything, dealing with other donor surgeons, dealing with OPO staff. And so for the most part, I think it doesn't even really go recognize that I'm something other than a physician. And then too, when that does come up, you know, I think 
it's pretty easy most of the time to recognize when people kind of know what they're doing and they're comfortable with what they're doing doing versus you know someone who's not quite sure with with what's going on and now thankfully i've had i've had so much exposure i've worked with a lot of these transplant programs you can you start to run in this into the same people over time right. Um, and so now it's it's definitely a non-issue. And I'm just curious, it's kind of putting you on the spot a little bit, but have you heard comments or know of any MDs or, or people who are just really feel like this is encroaching too much on their territory and that it's not a place for PAs to, to, to do this? Have you, have you experienced any of that? I mean, there's always people that are hard to work with. No one has really targeted me to my face, at least, about, you know, kind of being a PA and... and having scope creep or whatever they call it now. Yeah. Um, I will say there was one time some unknown person who claimed to be a physician from somewhere actually sent an email to the chair of the Department of Surgery because an, an article came out about what I was doing some time mm-hmm. ago and, and actually copied the article, sent it to the chair of the Department of Surgery and said something along the lines of, I can't believe you guys are allowing this. You know, why would you ever allow a PA to do this kind of thing? That was kind of the one big example of someone yeah. having a problem with it. Um, otherwise, I personally haven't heard a whole lot of pushback or seen a lot of pushback. That's good. Thankfully. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, you know, True. speaking of scope, this crossed my mind, is this within our scope of practice? I couldn't think of anything particular that would say that we can't. But do you have any thoughts of that? Or did you think about that at first and wonder, is it in our scope? And how do you... How do we even check things like that? Do you know what I'm asking? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the the one thing to keep in mind, then what for certain makes this possible in the first place is that, you know, in dealing with donors, they always already carry a clinical diagnosis of death of some kind, either brain death or cardiac death for DCD cases. I, I think that's that's what kind of puts it in a different category because I couldn't be doing an elective AVR by myself on somebody right. or doing an elective cabbage as the primary surgeon. So this this isn't quite the same as that. And the other thing to think about is this is something that's absolutely necessary because transplant programs, especially smaller transplant programs that don't have a lot of staff or resources, every time a program accepts an organ for transplant, they have to burn two surgeons. And so because there's so much unpredictability about the timing of all of this, if you have a relatively busy program, you have one surgeon implanting, another surgeon going to do the procurement, you know, those surgeons are canceling cases, they're canceling clinic, they start to develop a backlog, patients are getting upset, you just can't keep up. And so this has really been a great model and helped helped offload that burden from the staff surgeons. On top of that, there's a lot that's changed in thoracic organ procurement in the last few years. We've done a lot with machine reperfusion with the organ care system and NRP for DCD donor cases. Um, Everything's getting more complex. We're traveling farther than ever based on the allocation system changes. And so it's not just about flushing the heart, cutting it out and putting it in a cooler and taking it back anymore. And so you have to have people that are really specialized to be able to do it correctly and end up having good outcomes in the end. And I think the thoracic surgery community is aware of that. And so now we're starting to see, you know, other than kind of me as a PA, the, like the PA model, which is still having kind of a hard time taking off, you're starting to see these third party companies pop up where they'll they'll say, well, you know, hire us, we'll send a donor surgeon out to wherever the donor is, and we'll just take care of the procurement for you. And so a lot of programs are getting on board with that. The problem is there's still very, like, you don't know who these people are a lot of times. And there's variation amongst the ability of the donor surgeons, depending on who you get. So there's a convenience factor. But the the flip side of that is it's not necessarily that consistent. And so the one thing that's good about the PA model is like I'm part of the team of the transplant program. So we we can still send our own team out. The surgeons know exactly what my abilities are. They trust me and and we can still maintain control of the procurement side of the transplant. And so I think that has been very beneficial. And I think you can't underestimate the communication between two people who have worked together or several people who have worked together in a team. And when you say something that a certain way or a certain term you use, they are understanding it a certain way. You know, whereas if you introduce people that 
are not part of the team, they may be saying something that you are interpreting a different way. So I think that that's a good reason to have somebody on your team right. you know, that knows you doing the procurement. I think part of that too is, you know, there's such an organ shortage nationally. We're trying to use more what we call expanded criteria donor organs, where you know, we're taking older organs than we've ever taken before. We're taking more marginal organs because we're realizing that you know, with with the right preservation strategies, these organs actually do well. But at the same time, it ends up being my responsibility to provide a very accurate assessment of these organs so that I'm not missing something where, you know, you take it back and then you realize, oh, this organ isn't as good a quality as what we thought, and then it doesn't work and the patient has a bad outcome. And so there's, to your point, this big trust factor. You know, when we start going after more of these marginal or expanded criteria donor organs, it's up to me to to kind of tell the surgeon whether or not I think this organ is going to be viable. And then because they're not there, they have to rely on my assessment to make the go no go decision as far as whether we'll commit a recipient to that. Having you know a team that works closely together kind of really allows you to to kind of push the boundaries. Yeah, and I was wondering, and I'm not trying to harp on, on negatives and problems and barriers, I'm, but I'm just curious, like malpractice insurance, uh, was there any kind of struggles with that or anything that the hospital had to go through differently that you know of to get you completely covered in malpractice for this? There was a lot of administrative meetings about it. Most of that I wasn't part of. I, you know, I know the, the at one point the legal team was involved and they, you know, they kind of met with high level hospital leadership to kind of figure out what exactly this model looks like, what is the value, and, and answer some of those questions. It didn't take terribly long, so I don't think anyone really had major concerns about it. It's not outside the realm of possibility that more PAs could could ascend into this role. Is that fair to say, or is that something you see happening? Uh, there's definitely opportunity for it. Some of it depends on kind of the program you're a part of, what the leadership structure is. I can tell you not every program is on board with this idea. It kind of depends on where you are. It also kind of depends on what the, the academic structure is regarding the fellows. A lot, a lot of programs will just have like a senior and junior fellow kind of be the ones to do their procurements. However, kind of to my point earlier about this getting much more complicated with the use of machine reperfusion and other things, it's becoming where you need someone consistently there to make sure that things are going right. And actually, Columbia came out with a paper on that, comparing the PA procurement model compared to a, a fellow procurement oh. model and showed you know kind of a difference in outcomes given that there was someone who was like more of a quote unquote senior person who had a lot of experience. The, the consistency of kind of having one person being involved in doing a lot of the cases and overseeing what's going on, or maybe even teaching the fellows, there's value to oh. that. And the primary graft dysfunction rates and the donor organ injury rates were lower with that kind of a model. So that kind of model meaning the PA model? Correct. The PA yeah. the PA yeah. procurement model, Very correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, even, that's cool. We've been so busy too. It's it's hard for me to just kind of keep up with everything. But I mean there's a goal to to hire another PA that can kind of help me with some of this stuff and we'll you know okay. we'll train whoever that is, get them up to speed. And I assume that you're going to be in transplant in general, whether you're doing solo procurement or not, then you just have to be prepared 24-7 to, to drop what you're doing and get on a plane, right? Is that pretty much how it works? So you have a, a, at least a few hours heads up, if not like 12 to 24 hours heads up. Okay. It's not something where you know someone calls you and you have to drop what you're doing immediately okay. and go. <laughs> Usually we know you know, several hours ahead of time, but the weeks kind of ebb and flow. Some weeks are busier than others, but the timing of everything is is very unpredictable. It can be middle of the night, it can be during the day, it can be on the weekend or during the week. You don't really know for sure. So it's definitely a kind of a unique lifestyle. Yeah. So, you know, kind of assuming that there's no transplants on a, on a particular week, you know, usually come in about seven o'clock in the morning and then kind of help in the, the OR during the day and then kind of go home in the afternoon or early evening, depending on how busy the day is. And then kind of adjusting based on kind of what our transplant volumes are, kind of what <laughs> pops up during the week. So if I end up being up all night you know, doing a donor case, then it, I mean, if, thing is, if things are really busy here the next day, um, I may stick around to help a little bit, but they're pretty good for the most part about if, you, if you're if you burned the night before or over the weekend to getting you some time off to recover. Can you tell us what it is that you love so much about what you do? I, I think in my position, working 
for a transplant program, but being so heavily involved in the donor side, I, I get a lot of exposure to both sides of transplant. Now I get to, you know, be part of the organ donation process, understanding how how to preserve organs, utilizing technology to better preserve organs, and, and kind of being at the frontier of all that, where we're you know trying to travel farther than we've ever gone before. You know, some of the some of the flights that we take to get these organs are now over four hours away. These are things that we never would have done five years ago. And so this is a really fascinating time in in thoracic organ procurement. And so kind of being a big part of that and kind of you know becoming more the point person for a lot of those things has been a really incredible opportunity and it's been really exciting. But with that, I'm also able to take the organ back here and be involved in the transplant process and deal with kind of the recipient end and really see things all the way through. And so being part of both sides of the world of transplant has been very unique and very rewarding for me. Every job has its downside and things that are negatives about it. What do you think are the the biggest downsides or negatives to, to what it is that you do? Uh, the lifestyle can be very straining and there's so much unpredictability to this world. You know, the hours are long, it's weekends, it's holidays, it's kids' birthdays. It might current setting, you know, we have a, we have a very good and pretty robust team, so I'm not I'm not like the only person that can do it. So the flexibility there has been really nice. Previously, I was kind of like the main go-to person for all of the rest of procurement. It was very straining for me. Um yeah. it was straining from straining on my family. People for the most part within my program were supportive of the idea. No one knew whether or not it was going to work for sure, but in the end it was up to me to put into work to get myself there. And it was 100 plus hours a week, what? a lot of overnights, and it was all volunteer. Like I wasn't getting paid for it because this, I really didn't have a formal position yet. I had to prove myself. And, and that took a lot of effort up front on my behalf with no real promise that I would ever get to where I wanted to end up. So I'm very appreciative for the opportunity and the support. But up front, it was a ton of effort and a lot of sacrifice on my family. So I think that's that's probably the biggest thing. So if there's somebody watching this who is like, that is my dream job and my goal. Any other things that you would advise them to to do, to study? That's a good question. I think exposure is big because there's a lot of unique challenges related to, to this line of work. Conceptually, it sounds really appealing, but you know the, the lifestyle certainly isn't for everyone. Or people find that they're not as comfortable in the, the donor OR as what they thought they might be. And so kind of getting your feet wet with just observe, like taking any opportunity you can to observe elective cardiac surgery or, or organ donation, anything like that to really get a good feel for what it's about, I think is a good start. As far as things to study with any job in surgery, you really have to understand anatomy. And then there's a lot of ways to access different surgical videos online. So you can look up pretty much any type of operation and and see some type of video that somebody's done about what that looks like and kind of learn the general idea of what they're doing, what the technical steps are kind of increase your your knowledge base as much as possible. If somebody was, if this is their path or that what they think is their path, I mean, obviously they've got to spend years doing cardiothoracic surgery in general, but if they are at that point where they've got a lot of experience and they're thinking this is something they would like be interested in, do you think they would have a better chance of finding programs that are more open to this in the major academic centers? So it's it's really hard to say. And a lot of it depends on what the leadership structure is at the time. I've had several PA colleagues from different programs reach out to me and, and kind of ask me how I got to this point what the you know what the struggles were and unfortunately what i found early on at my previous job and what a lot of my colleagues are finding out is one of the biggest barriers is the pa leadership structure itself um it's not something that i expected but that's that's a very common theme i think this is such a unique position that no one really understands it or knows what to do with it other than the transplant surgeons themselves because nobody in at least the PA world has any exposure or understanding of thoracic procurement. 
And then on top of that, pretty much everyone that's reached out to me is already a cardiothoracic PA somewhere. And so they have their normal job description and their normal responsibilities. And if they put in the time, you know, that would be required for them to become competent at thoracic organ procurement, unless you're donating all your time like I did, and I mean, basically donating your life to this for two or three years, right. which is really not sustainable for anybody. The only way to to be able to have the time to put the effort into becoming competent at this, you have to let go of some of your normal day job responsibilities, mm. which a lot of, you know, if if you're working as part of a group, that means your other colleagues have to pick up the slack or they have to hire somebody else. And nobody really knows how to deal with that or manage that uh, in general, or or they don't want to deal with that or manage that. And so it's unfortunate, but it seems like, you know, PA leadership is just in, in at some of these other programs from people that I've talked to have, have just not been fully supportive or understanding of being mm-hmm. able to help help someone who has that interest a- accomplish that yeah. goal. Um, and so I'm not really sure how to manage that well, other than kind of getting the exposure out there. But it's not something that everybody can do or even wants to do. So it's not like a, a PA lead can just make the decision like, well, my entire group's going to start doing this. Right. <laughs> um, it, it really has to be one person, maybe two right. people over a handful of years. Um, and so that means that that subset, either that person or, or those couple of people that are training are going to be in a different situation than the rest of the, the people yeah. in the group. Um, and so how do you, how do you, compensate that? How do you manage the time? How do you manage the call for the rest of the group? That was a big problem for me early on. Um, and it's it's a big problem with, with a few of the people that have reached out to me to the point where, you know, it kind of just for unfortunately for a couple colleagues that I know, it just kind of fizzled out and it just never yeah. really got anywhere. And so I'd like to see that change somehow over time. I'm still trying to understand that more and and i don't really have a good answer for that right now unfortunately it probably at this point comes down to to luck of meeting the right people or a program or leadership that's open to it you know part of the reason that i love to do this channel is to highlight some of the cool and amazing things that pas are doing because i think that if it's not even on somebody it's like a it's like a differential diagnosis if it's not even on your radar you're never going to think of it right and so right. maybe as this becomes more you know people talk about it more and, and and more exposure that this is is something that happens maybe there'll be some change in the future so it, it definitely is something that i see could be a really good model but right now you're just kind of a unicorn i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully that will change with time. There's definitely other other PAs out there that are looking to establish themselves as well, and hopefully we'll get more there with time. But yeah. what we're we're hoping to do here is um, once we hire a second person and really kind of show that this is reproducible, bring some exposure on a national scale, and try and make this more of a, a standard thing for PAs. Uh, down the road. So that's what we're going to be looking to do here, hopefully in the next couple of years. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, for telling us about the amazing work that you're doing. Congratulations on getting to this point in your career. And just thanks for being a great representative of the PA profession. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me. Thank you very much. I love interviewing PAs who are out there doing such cool and amazing things. And if this is something that really touches you and makes you think that this is the exact place for you in medicine, then be encouraged that there are a couple PAs out there doing it, which means it's possible. But just know that it is going to probably be a quite an uphill battle, but not impossible, obviously. If you're a PA or an NP who's watching this and you really are not sure what is the right fit for you in medicine, what your niche would be, then I suggest watching some more videos on my channel. Maybe going through these videos, you will find something that resonates with you and help you find your true path and your true calling in medicine. Thanks for joining me today. Take care, stay sane, and I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye.